Today we're going to talk about neuroscience, everything from neuron all the way up to large-scale brain structure. And the key question here is how can something as simple as a neuron support everything that goes on inside our brain and ultimately really, you know, everything that happens for us. We our subjective experience. If we believe in the subjective world of science and the fact that neurons comprise our brains and our brains support everything that we experience subjectively, somehow that has to happen. And the only way we can really understand that is if somehow when those neurons get together, some kind of magic happens, right? And if we're scientists, we wanna take that out of the realm of magic and turn it into something that we can really understand. And even though it's kind of mind blowing uh, and probably impossible really to understand at a subjective level, we can get some leverage on that by understanding this really important principle of emergence. And this is illustrated in this diagram with the simplest possible case I know of to illustrate the, the principle of emergence. So here you see two gears. On the left, you just have these gears kind of sitting there. Nothing's happening. They could spin all they want and whatever. It's just kind of uh, that system is literally the sum of its parts, okay? It's just two gears. But something kind of magic does actually happen over here on panel B when you have the two gears interacting with each other. And this is really the key point is interactions give rise to something that cannot be reduced to either component by itself, okay? And it's the same thing that happens when two people get together. You probably get that subjective feeling, like you're not actually the same person when you're uh, interacting with another person as you might be with you know, a different other person or with a larger group of people or when you're by yourself. And so there's something that changes, something that, that happens uh, that you know isn't just about you and it isn't just about the other person. It's about somehow that interaction, that magic that happens when people get together. Um, and the same thing happens uh, at a very simple level with respect to gears. So these gears, uh, when they interact, produce a uh, set of emergent phenomena that have to do with the relationships between the gears. So for example, the small gear is gonna spin much faster compared to the large gear. Um, it's gonna have a higher level of torque um, if the small gear is driving the big gear. Um, it'll spin faster and then it'll produce a larger amount of torque or power on this other gear. But if you actually took this larger gear and connected it to a yet larger gear than itself, everything would be reversed, right? Those relationships between torque and rotation speed would change completely because it's all about the relationship. And this is the same thing, again, that the individual kind of experience changes depending on who you're interacting with. And that is an emergent phenomenon. You cannot say it's one or the other. The interaction produces something that's, that's far greater than uh, the sum of its parts. And if you take the same principle and you apply it to the bigger picture of the brain and neurons, you can see that this is gonna just be exponentially more emergent phenomena taking place. This is only two simple, very simple elements interacting with each other. Even if you don't quite understand, you know, what torque is and the rate of rotation and how these things actually work, um, take my word for it, there's a few properties that kind of emerge out of the interaction from this thing. But when you have uh, a neuron receiving information from 10,000 other neurons, and communicating to, again, sending those signals out to another whole population of neurons, those interactions are just so much more complicated and so rich um, that even if the neurons themselves are actually relatively simple, you can get this massive amount of emergent phenomena. And so maybe that gives you some sense of like how all the amazing complexity of our human minds can emerge out of something as simple as a neuron. So our first goal here in the, in the lecture is to look at individual neurons and see how they could actually function and, and produce anything at all like cognition, okay? And that's a real big conceptual leap, but I hope you'll see that it, it actually does sort of make sense. So this is a picture, a drawing of an individual neuron in the uh, neocortex, the main area of the brain that we're interested in. 
You can see here uh, the cell body, which is just like the body of any other type of cell. And what makes a neuron unique is the presence of all these branching dendrites. Dendrite literally means tree. Um, and so these guys look like trees. Uh, you can kind of barely see if you focus there uh, that there are these little spines on the dendrites. And that's where the axons from other cells come in and make those synaptic connections that are the inputs to each individual neuron. We'll see that in a second. And then this neuron is sending the output through its axon, uh, sending that signal on to other neurons. So those are the principal parts of the neuron. Um, and the main thing that we can think about conceptually, functionally, for what a neuron is doing is this really simple concept of detecting. So neurons are kind of sampling all those different synaptic inputs that they're getting and they're looking for signals, things that make sense to those neurons, right? Um, and so by analogy, it's sort of like a smoke detector sampling the air and sort of seeing is there, is, an, is there enough smoke here to warrant me getting alarmed and saying, ah, there's this, there might be a fire, uh, there's certainly some smoke, okay? Uh, and so that's really what neurons are doing is looking for signals and then the alarm, the signal, the, the, the thing they send is those action potentials, those spikes down their axon to other neurons. And so this is really the key concept here. Here we have a functional uh, description of a neuron on the left and then the anatomical corresponding uh, properties of that neuron on the right. So you have uh, inputs coming in through the axons of other neurons. They hit these synapses here, uh, those little green things. And that's, again, sort of like the, the sensor on a smoke detector is kind of receiving these different inputs sampling from the world. Um, as we mentioned before, there's 10,000 inputs on a typical uh, pyramidal neuron in the neocortex. And then the cell body sort of is the place where all those signals converge um, from all those dendrites coming in. Uh, you have in an integration process that we'll look at real quickly um, that balances the different inputs. It turns out you're not only receiving excitatory inputs, but also inhibitory inputs. And so computing the balance between those two is critical. And then you have that critical step. I keep saying critical. You have that critical step that determines is the signal that's coming in strong enough to warrant me as a neuron sending this signal out saying, hey, I've detected something important here. You other neurons should pay attention. If it's not above that threshold, the neuron does not send a spike. If it is above that threshold, it does send a spike. And so that's really the critical thing that happens right here. Um, this is called the axon hillock uh, right at the end of the cell body and before it starts out on the axon. And really these axons are kind of like wires. They have these myelin sheaths that cover them, that insulate the wires. And, um, and so, you know, it really is kind of an electrical system. We'll see that it actually the internal uh, properties of the neuron function as an electrical system. And so that you can really think about this as a miniature kind of electronic component uh, that's integrating all these signals and then sending out that, uh, that alarm to others. So does it really make sense? to think about everything that happens in the brain in terms of detection. How can we understand how detection gives rise to all these other properties? Uh, before we do that, I just wanna say also to emphasize that because they're getting 10,000 different inputs um, and sending out one signal, neurons fundamentally compress information. So this notion, this three C's that we've been talking about, the fact that you and your brain are so driven towards compressing and simplifying the world into these simpler concepts, that comes about directly in each individual neuron in the brain, taking in these 10,000 different inputs and putting out that one single output. So you really kind of see it as this funnel, funneling down all those the complex information and reducing it to a single like, yes, I've detected something or no, I haven't detected it. So that's the fundamental compression. Um, so uh, there's been various kinds of ideas over the years about how these kind of detector-like models might operate. This is a diagram from Oliver Selfridge uh, in a in in-person class. I typically actually try to do this and have individual people in the class take on the role of these different demons. Um, you get to be a demon for the day and try to uh, detect 
uh, different features of an image that's shown on the screen. And what this shows you is that you can break down kind of more complex processes of kind of recognizing patterns by having individual features being detected by individual neurons. And so this is really the kind of key idea about how neurons work is they take overall very complex problems, recognizing faces, for example, um, and break it down into little tiny steps where each step is a kind of micro detection, right? And so in the case of the feature demons, they're kind of saying, I sort of recognize a diagonal line going up or a horizontal line going across for this A. And so each individual feature demon is kind of encoding a single feature. Uh, but then at the next level up, you have the ability to integrate across all those different features and sort of say, oh, well, I'm getting both that kind of diagonal line up, the other diagonal line and that horizontal, that must mean that an A is present in the input. And so then this, cognitive demon can fire. Uh, and in this in-class demonstration, you just have people shouting. <laughs> um, it's kind of chaos. And then the upper level beyond that is some kind of decision demon that's trying to integrate across all those signals and see who's shouting the loudest and therefore who, you know, what, what feature might actually be out there in the real world. And so uh, this kind of process of detection going up through a hierarchy is really the way we understand how the brain works. This is a, a very much how the visual system works. Um, this is now very well established. Uh, we know, for example, from the pioneering work of uh, Hubel and Weasel that we'll talk about in the perception chapter, that uh, there are these little feature detectors in V1 that detect oriented edges, bars of light or transitions from light to dark. Um, and so if you're looking at this space out there, you're kind of breaking down that overall shape into a kind of set of oriented features. And then those are the simple features. V2 takes one further step and builds up more complex combinations of those features and so on and so on. So V4, the next level up, don't ask about V3 for the moment. Um, it's there, but we uh, it's a slightly different area. So you get more complex combinations of those features. Again, just taking that same principle of detection and applying it over and over again as you go higher and higher up the hierarchy until, and this is the key point, at the highest levels, you have these detectors that encode really important behaviorally relevant information. And this is the, the point at which you now sort of are conscious in your you know, everyday life of perceiving the world. You don't perceive these little kind of line segments. You perceive oh, you know, that's my friend Bill or whatever, you know. Um, you have these high level concepts uh, encoding who you're actually seeing, right? Um, or what object it is. Okay, there's my coffee cup. So hopefully, you know, it's using this diagram, get, kind of getting an intuition about what's going on, you can kind of see that a, a cascade, a hierarchy of these detectors can lead to high level information and finally, at this highest level, you have stuff that you can actually act on. So that person is nice, and therefore I'm going to smile at them. And that person owes me money, so maybe I'm going to do something else. Um, so these kind of high-level concepts uh, going beyond individual people uh, allow us to then guide our behavior towards those people in appropriate ways. And that's ultimately what the brain is ultimately trying to do is compress all that signal coming in, all the kind of incredible detail uh, present visually, compress it down into categories that allow us to act. Because fundamentally the brain is about action. That's what we ultimately care about is what are we gonna do? And so if you can take all those complex signals and turn it into something actionable, uh, that's what we care about. And that's really the, the point of compression is you know nobody really cares about all the details about how the visual system works except of course people are trying to reverse engineer it or figure out how it actually works scientifically but the average user of that system is like whatever i don't care uh i just want to be able to see stuff and do what i want to do right um and so that's really where this principle of compression comes from that that our brains are really trying to make it efficient for us to behave and act in the world and to develop those concepts that allow us to you know, guide our behavior in the most efficient way.